We are going to go ahead and, and start now because uh, Dr. Givitz has Dr. Givitz has some things he wants to, to share with you. We want to leave time for questions. Uh, we're going to do just a real quick um, update on some of the things that have gone on and are going on on campus. Uh, my apologies if I can't get to everything, but uh, if you check out the perspectives and I connect, uh, there's a lot of information that you get on a very, very, very regular basis. Uh, hopefully this past year you've noticed uh, some kind of unique and, and nice changes on campus. If you haven't, I'd encourage you to go over to the Gutensong Clinic and uh, check out each floor. The public spaces have been renovated. Lots of positive comments from the community, lots of positive comments from uh, patients who go in and out. And uh, this is just something, if you haven't seen it, it really is, it really is worth going over and taking a look at it. Uh, once again, a great place for the community to come in to receive care uh, for our residents and our students to, to have education and something I think that, uh, that we've needed to do and to be competitive with other space within the city uh, that they lease to physicians and other groups. So uh, thanks to um, Rick Reeder and his crew for uh, finishing the project that Dr. McManus started uh, and got things going. And so if you haven't had a chance, please get over there and take a look. Uh, you know, Monty was always pretty bashful about asking for anything. Uh, and so when, when Monty left, we did a survey. I think we talked about the trailer walls that were in there and some of the cool things. And we tried to give those away uh, as floats for the river and, and different things. Uh, but we have now got this uh, area for finance uh, up and running. And it looks really, really nice. And once again, Rick Reeder kind of oversaw the project. And uh, a place now where, once again, the uh, privacy uh, that's needed when you're dealing with these types of issues is available. And uh, just, I think, a very nice environment for those folks to work in. So that was a, a major accomplishment this last fiscal year. Uh, as many of you recall, this was what I remember the gas station when I was a student. Uh, and under the Water Tower Cafe right behind there, the building is still there, but the restaurant isn't. Uh, and once again, trying to do something with this building so it fit in with the buildings east and west. So there was a little bit of a blend. So once again, a campus feel when you come on campus. And then renovation inside, so they were uh, a little bit nicer for our, our um, faculty and staff to work in. And then you probably notice we have completed the plaza down here. Once again, another three-year project. Um, <laughs> and uh, that's just kind of how it goes here. So it just takes a while to get things done. But a place eventually where the public can kind of see into the campus, we can see out, uh, open things up, kind of got rid of the confusing um, circular driveway that was here connecting to the new parking lot that was uh, was in place for the IPE building, the expansion of that parking lot. And eventually we want to do perhaps a Ramada here where we can have uh, uh, some tables and some places for uh, faculty, staff, and students to gather when the weather is good. Uh, and we think of this opens up the campus. We had a great seal here that was donated by the auxiliary that had been broken into at least five or 6,000 pieces by the skateboarders. And the water had gotten in there and kind of eroded and rotted the bottom of it. And so uh, we were just unable to, to, to save that piece. And so that was something that we took some photos of. We contacted the folks who tried to find the donors to let them know to, to get their permission. Uh, unfortunately, those folks have moved on uh, and are no longer uh, in the area. Um, and so we were able to kind of create a plaza type of uh, area for the campus. So we are not kind of walled off from Jefferson and walled off from folks. If you haven't had a chance, if you can stand here and look across, or over here and look across, or if you dare get up on the buildings, don't let us know about that. Um, but you can see it from the offices over here. Once again, I think it opens up and gives us kind of a campus feel. So now when you look down, or you look east or west on Jefferson, there's really a presence as you start to come onto the campus. We're working on uh, signage on how we direct folks, especially in the kind of treacherous area right in front of Gutensong Clinic where it goes from two-way to one-way and then it's up to anybody to figure the rest out. Uh, we're working on some wayfinding and some signage right away so we can hopefully um, get, that, uh, get that area a little bit safer with traffic moving in and out. So those are kind of some of the things that we've worked on uh, the last couple of years. And as you recall, we now have a study of all of our buildings looking 10 years out. And it's a very sophisticated study that will be updated each year. And Rick Reeder is going to present that to one of the, uh, to, to a lunch and learn for everybody. But basically, it looked at every building and every system uh, of the buildings that we own. I believe it did not include the AHEC building. Is that correct? Because that was just recently redone. But, uh, you know, we kind of know that one inside and out, basically. But every other building looked at everything, electrical, all the mechanical, et cetera. And it gave us a yellow, red, or green code to it. 
You want to, we had no buildings in the red code, which means, you know, imminent problems. We had a couple in the yellow area, and then over the 10 years, we expect some to move from green to yellow, and if nothing's done to the red category. And so this very sophisticated software can take any updates that we do, put those in, it'll give us an annual cost adjusted for inflation for the construction uh, types of costs. I don't believe it includes the architect costs, so we would put a percent on for that. But it came back, a little surprise to us, that the boiler, what they actually call the boiler house, that's kind of a cool name, right? I mean, boiler house, that's just, a, sounds like a restaurant. Uh, but the boiler house was really the one that's the yellow that if we don't do something over a period of time, it would get to red, and then that's not a good thing. So they're working on that. Uh, Rick has been working on uh, getting some estimates to bring that up, working with Emron, the energy uh, supply company, to figure out how we can do some redundant systems that would protect the university and the hospital. And so you'll be hearing more about this as it, as it goes along. And once again, these processes, please, uh, hopefully there are some chairs. If you guys want to come on over here and sit down, you're welcome, or you can stand in. I know you like to stand. Can you jog in place for us? And then the Tim Burnett Research Building, uh, we've had a, a group go through and take some initial looks at the mechanical. The goal is to get a final bid on what it's going to cost to fix and upgrade all the mechanical within that building. And then hopefully once that's done, go floor by floor and, and uh, help it uh, function better and be more aesthetic. And so that's a project that we're trying to at least get our arms around, so to speak, this year so we can figure out what the costs are. It was interesting, uh, as we started thinking about this, Rick and I kind of both threw out some numbers of what we thought the cost was going to be. And we both came up pretty close. We said about 18 to 20 million. And it came in right around, I believe, 20 million over the next 10 years that we'll have to invest in the campus to keep things uh, from going to that yellow to red. And it's important to remember that when we go from, you know, when we stabilize these structures, we're not modernizing them per se. We're, we're, we're fixing things, but we're not putting in new carpets or new paints or new furniture. That's not included in that 20 million. So we'll have to kind of go back and figure out how we're going to do that in a, in a stepwise area. The Howard Building. W, how many know that, which, where the Howard Building is? Oh, good. Okay, very good. So let me, if I get this wrong, don't throw anything at me. It's the area where the uh, CFO controller, the area that we showed earlier. Is that correct? Is that, is that how it goes? So it's kind of right before you get to human resources. That's considered the Howard Building. And then I believe Donna Brown, off, Donna Brown, your office sits in what we call the East Wing, which is really West. Okay. So does, that, does everybody get that? So here's how you tell. You go, you, you, you go by the President's office, you keep walking. When you see the controller's office, you know that that's Howard. And then when you feel the wood floor, you know that that's the West Wing. That's how I do it, OK? East Wing. It's on the West, though. I know. Sorry about that. Woo! And then the Thomas Campus Center uh, was identified, and we actually have uh, the architect has been looking at some ways to uh, work that lower level where the locker rooms are, once again, to make those more functional uh, private areas for people and uh, make it something that, once again, our faculty, staff, students, and community will use more frequently and, and bring that up, once again, to, to where we think it should be. Memorial Hall, we're aware of that building, and then, once again, the East Wing, and then the Wright Building. Now, the Wright Building, Used to be the car dealership a long time ago. Is that correct? Yeah, good. So the, that, when I was here, okay, so there was a kind of a hotel connected to it. That's gone. But the building just north of the, how, let's see, just north of the Memorial Hall Couch building, that building is the right building. So, whew, all right, got through that. All right, well, this is enough to keep us busy for a while. But just so you know, as things happen, construction occurs. If we don't send out a memo, it's not that we're trying to intentionally leave anybody out. It's just sometimes a sequence of these things happen where they call and they go, hey, listen, we have a, we have a uh, tractor. Can we come over? Yeah, come on over. Let's try to get this stuff done when we can. And we try to. We try to do it at times that it will cause the least disruption to, to your lives and our students' lives. So some of the things that are happening. We had some goals last year, uh, create a simplified access point for university data distribution. We're going to show you a sample of that. Really neat stuff. Uh, we showed it to the Arizona campus a few weeks ago, and, uh, and it was pretty powerful. So I think the, uh, John Hurd and his shop and all those that contributed to providing things that they need, this is a first step. It's probably a two or three step process, but this was the first step was to do this, and I think you'll, you'll be very impressed. Refine ATSU's vision of preeminence. Dr. Gevitz might talk a little bit more about that, but Dr. Gevitz and Dr. Wendell will be finishing up that discussion and present a, uh, a, a summary to our Board of Trustees in October. 
once again, it was a 15-year vision. So the vision was 15 years. We're just past year five of that vision of preeminence. We have the three areas that we define the preeminence, and we're looking at how we can, can further have those discussions. And we'll, Dr. Gevitz will talk about some specific examples and things that are currently going on. And life-work balance. Uh, Donna Brown and Lori Haxton and the folks that they work with did a great job putting together a white paper. By the way, information on all these is available. On that last perspective, there's a place to click on and learn about some of these things and read associated white papers and reports. So uh, the life-work balance, we've already um, started implementing some of those. And we've taken from our strategic planning budget, we've taken $100,000 this year to invest in you. And so they're coming up with ways to keep you healthier, to keep you limit the amount of stress, to make the work environment better. And so they're going to continue on this for this year. And if we look at our goals this year, we're doing a campus climate survey around cultural proficiency. Once again, for our healthcare providers today, it's different than when I went out. But for our DO students, our dental students, all of our students at ASHES, and our COG students, to be really the best you can be, you've got to understand that we live in a very, very cultural, diverse world. And the world has changed significantly. And in order to be, once again, the best employee, the best healthcare provider, the best dad, the best mom, the best that we can be, we really have to understand about cultural proficiency. And that's one of our goals here at this university is to make sure that we let you know some of the latest data and ways to become more proficient. And for the providers that are going to go out there and once again deliver care to a changing, rapidly changing world. In many ways, we owe that to our students to make sure that they understand cultural proficiency and they're moving in that direction. And this is something that you see when our students go out on rotations and they go to inner cities and they go to rural areas and they go to places where people aren't where they were from and they don't look like them. And we do a great job, Dr. Trish Sexton and others do a great job of bringing this to the forefront, but we really have to focus and concentrate on this as an institution. Very good. Professional development, we've got a number of activities that we're working for with for both our staff and for our faculty to understand what they need from a professional development standpoint, what direction they want to head, how we budget for that. One of the areas that we're working on is a management leadership institute for our, uh, those that are working and managing uh, employees and, and coworkers. How do you handle situations? How do you perform at the highest level? How do you make your life easier so you're not laying awake at night wondering, wow, what, what did I do? What do I say? Did I do something wrong? And uh, Rick Reeder and the HR folks are arranging to have uh, a, a program brought in from the University of Missouri, Columbia. Uh, that will go on both campuses that will allow our folks that, that have to work uh, in that area to develop skills. Uh, they'll get a certificate for attending that uh, and it will be something I think that will make everybody's lives easier. Uh, Rick and several of your folks went to that uh, so they've actually gone to it and, and participated in it and found value in it so we want to bring that to our staff and faculty that are interested. There's another of, a number of areas I believe there's a survey going around looking at professional development and uh, we're looking forward to understanding what those needs are and then budgeting for those needs this uh, fiscal year. And then Life Work Balance 2.0. Uh, now that we have some ideas of what we need to do, we want to continue to push that and do that and move forward to that. We want to hear from you. We want to know what you need to do your jobs effectively, but also to have, have fulfilling lives away from school that we can do things. So for instance, the financial seminars on ideas for retirement and things regarding our benefits and our Stillwell program. All those things we kind of take for granted because we're so used to them, but they're really unique things that you can access and, and improve um, where you are physically and maybe financially in some of those things by participating in some of these development things that we want to bring to you. And once again, a little bit of professional and personal development in that life-work balance. So we talked a little bit about what we did last year. We talked about the cultural proficiency understanding uh, and making that, continue that to make a priority. Our scholarly activity, once again, a tremendous amount of research. Thank you, thank you faculty and staff that support that. We're gonna talk a little bit about virtual reality and augmented reality. On your tables, if you haven't had a chance yet, if you could just take a look at that little model that's printed, uh, that's done with a very simple uh, 3D printer, right? I don't understand all the technology of it, but it's over in the library and our students can go in there and they can print things that they're studying. They can try out new ideas. 
They could print prototypical devices that they think might be of use in some way. Uh, they can just let their imagination go free. And I was talking earlier, we had the NAC meeting, the National Association of Health Centers in Chicago this weekend. And on Michigan Avenue, there was a candy store. Of course, when you have an eight and a half year old, you know, you're going into the candy store whether you want to or not. Oh, it's closed. No, it's open, Dad. Um, <laughs> anyways, in there they had this really cool printer for candy. And they had the iPads there, and you kind of walk up, you hit what you want, and you can either make a custom piece, you can write your name, or you can pick something out, and it's a little machine that makes a gummy candy for you. And, uh, and custom design your candy. They had, a, they had a chocolate one there, but I couldn't find it. Um, but the gummy bear one was cool. So we're going to talk a little bit about the scholarly activity. So we're, we're very committed. Uh, we've already put some funds together to put in our scholarly activity for virtual reality and augmented reality. We did have Pokemon on the Arizona campus. You might have seen that in the, uh, I think it was in the Wall Street Journal. So we had uh, two of them running around the building in Arizona. We, we didn't ask for them, but they just showed up. Um, but you know, the world is different. My son, augmented reality is just part of what he, what he sees every day and does. So at the Lego store, once again, I did go to the meetings. But the Lego store in Chicago, he takes this big giant Lego off and he walks over to the screen. And then all of a sudden, it's an augmented reality. He's interacting with the Millennium Falcon. It was, a, it was the oddest thing. I've got a video of it. But this is the environment that people are growing up in. Our, our patients will expect this. Our students will expect this. Our museum will reflect that. And eventually, I think the way we innovate in teaching will reflect that. So we'll do a little bit more of that today. Family restrooms on the Kirksville campus at the, on the Gutensong first floor, there's a family restroom. Uh, in Arizona, we've identified a second floor area, I believe second floor, to put a, a family restroom. And once again, this is kind of keeping up with what we need to do to be friendly. Uh, to all of our students and families and folks that come onto campus. The bookstore, we're working on uh, trying to bring, once again, that into the century. It hasn't changed much since I was a student. There's a kind of barrier there. We kind of want you in, but we don't want. We're going to put up this big counter. Uh, you're not sure what's in there. Uh, and we're working with architects to redesign that bookstore, make it a, a more friendly place, perhaps some place where people can come, have a cup of coffee, sit on some appropriate uh, seating, and make it a little bit more fun, interactive part of the campus. So you'll be seeing those, I think, plans of kind of going through an evolution, and, and Rick and his group are working on that. So we talk about preeminence, and I don't want to steal Dr. Gevitz's thunder, but we had some amazing things. And, and once again, I know I don't have them all in the perspectives. We put a kudos together every time we print it. But Dr. Wilson, once again, kind of the medallion award at the 2016 Mayops Convention, kind of one of the highest honor, one of the highest honors you can earn as, a, as an osteopathic physician in the state. They, in Arizona, we have the same type of thing, but we have it called the uh, Excellence in Osteopathic Medical Education, and Dr. Heath received that award this year. So how, how cool we have people, faculty, and leadership on both campuses being recognized in their state as kind of the preeminent individuals in these areas, something I think to be proud of. Dr. Rausch, uh, physical therapy uh, faculty, uh, received the Lucy Blair Service Award. Once again, a big deal. This is a national award. And he was awarded that, and he's been with us, I believe, since the beginning, if not the early years, of the Arizona campus. Dr. Sowers and Dr. Vallis McLeod received the Distinguished Athletic Trainer of the Year Award. This is a big deal at the annual convention in Indianapolis. So they were signaled out and recognized as preeminent in their field. I know that there's a lot of other folks who, who've received recognition and have done publications. This weekend, I was at the NAC conference in Chicago. The opening session, I want you to imagine the biggest ballroom you've ever seen looks like a football field, thousands of people in there. We have, uh, we have as many tables as here of our students and staff and faculty there. And the CEO comes over at the beginning and walks around to each table and says how glad he is to have the students there. Now, this is the organization that oversees the care for 25 million Americans, 25 million Americans. So it is the largest organization that helps influence care in community health centers. So he went around to each table and thanked the students. Then he said, he said, Craig, you know, if money was no, if there was no limit, if we could give you as much money, how effectively and how many people could you, could you help educate? Because depending on the election, they're expecting a doubling of the funding for community health centers. And so the problem is providers are short. <laughs> a health center group in LA came up during our reception in Los Angeles from Los Angeles and said, we have 150 openings today. 150 openings for physicians and providers today. So this is just one small health center group in, in California, and that's just, just one, one group's need. But the uh, chairman got up 
uh, and mentioned AT Still University, had all the students stand up, faculty and staff, and they, the 3,000 people applauded them. And it was a really great moment for our students, both from Mosdo and mainly from SOMA. And once again, the students said, wow, this is really a big deal. We didn't understand how important this relationship was and how big it was. Then later, in the same opening session, the CEO got up and once again acknowledged AT Still University. So remember that these are, this is the big, this is the big player in the country. So compared to Kaiser, it's, it's a giant. Even Kaiser and Geisinger, Banner, those are all small potatoes compared to NAC and CHCs. So we are really, at this stage, their preeminent go-to person for the education of physicians and dentists. And they want to do more, and they're hoping that they can do more. They love AT Still. They love the model. And that really is a preeminence acknowledgement. All right, now speaking of preeminence, uh, please get your cell phones out. <coughs> I'm going to try not to break anything, but it could be funny. Now I'm going to put this on, and it has nothing to do with Silence of the Lambs. Um, So do I, I, have a, I might have a big head for this thing. Okay, good. All right, so we're going to take a look at some of the VR and AR stuff here. I better grab that first, right? All right, now there's a good, there's a 50-50 chance I'm going to trip and fall and get dizzy and pass out. Okay, and I love it. All I ask is that you raise my feet, uh, and if the defibrillator's around, just hook it up. And uh, if I need shocking, it'll shock me. But we're going to do some VR. We're going to go look at some anatomy, and. Um, Dean, why do I see the control just floating there? Are there two controls? Okay, thank you. All right, so what I'm looking at now is a grid that tells me my border, so I know where everybody is, and I know not to back up or touch that border. And pretty soon I'm going to see a, and you should hopefully see, Dean, I see that thing again, just so you know what I'm seeing. You probably see it too. And we're going to hopefully go in and, and do a little bit of anatomy. Now, you can imagine uh, the usefulness of this thing, and I really feel like I'm in a studio right now. And eventually, I'm going to see, I think, a skeleton come before me, and we're going to do some things. Step out and turn around. Good. Ah, there it is. Okay. So I'm going to reach out, and I think I'm step a little closer to it. Well, the wall's right there. At least I'm getting the grid right there. All right, this is really funny, isn't it? Closer even. Okay. All right, let me know if I'm going to hit something. <coughs> I know this is, this is now I'm, I'm in the grid. I'm through the grid. I'm doing everything you told me not to do, all right? Now, can everybody see the skeleton? All right, now I'm going to walk up to the skeleton. Now, once again, I'm walking through the grid. That's okay, Dean? Okay, I'm, I'm walking through the wall. Uh, am I going to have any other things to do like that? All right, stop right there. Okay, now I'm going to take this. Now, can everybody see the skeleton there? All right, I'm going to go ahead and go into this area right here. And then I'm going to be able to take this. I'm going to be able to slice through. I'm going to be able to look at it. Now, to me... It looks like I'm actually standing next to a skeleton and being able to slice through it and see all the different anatomy points. I can go this way. I can go this way. You can actually look out here, and this is either some stool or some gas, kind of those little brown pockets there. And then you can kind of look back here and see some really unique and different things. And I can come out of this part of the anatomy. I can grab this, and I can click on this, I believe, up here. Oh, there's something right there. Step out and around. Same way. Okay, there's things floating all around me. There's my reset button. I can go up to, I can go to a different part, say the lumbar spine. Okay, I apologize. Go down here to the lumbar spine, click on, and then I can actually grab this and I can slice through the lumbar spine. So I can see, for instance, this, this one has a, some spondylosis or some osteoarthritis in it. And once again, I can go down, I can cut this way. And this is just one thing out of many, many things in VR and augmented reality. This is a virtual reality and augmented reality. So these are tools that our faculty can use, our students can use. We have, uh, we have put $50,000 into um, some av availability of faculty and students to begin doing a little bit of research in this area. Wow. And uh, all I can tell you, it's, it's, it's amazing. And so if you are looking for anything for the birthday party or anniversary, um, <laughs> Dean will come to your home. And, uh, but it's amazing. And so yesterday they gave me another experience. Uh, and I'm not sure exactly how this was related, but it, it is. The, they put me in the middle of a Star Wars battle. And I actually had a lightsaber, and I was fending off the shots, and the thing was landing on top of me, and the stormtroopers were running after me, and R2-D2 was behind me, and it was pretty fascinating. Um, I got a good workout in. Uh, but I really think that this will be the future, because we can take our students, and we can put them in an emergency room. We can have them respond right on a battle scene. 
We can have them do things that simply are just not possible in, in the four walls and the way that we educate now. But imagine being able to have a closer look at some of the bacteria and the viruses and things, be able to hold them and manipulate them and understand, you know, wow, this is really, you know, this is really how it looks and how it feels. So there's a lot of opportunities uh, to educate our students, our patients, and for our faculty um, to go into new areas and, and think about some of these things. Uh, now we're going to talk a, just a couple minutes about our data analysis. So whenever you're ready, if you want to bring that up. And so one of the things that was asked for uh, quite, quite a long time ago was how can we gather data and have a central point for data that's kind of time stamped. So when you're talking to somebody and I'm talking to somebody and Bob's talking to somebody and Dr. Gevitz, that we all are saying the same thing about whatever the analytic number or whatever metric we're talking about. And so uh, John Hurd and Dr. Gevitz got together and said, let's go down this road together. It's not going to be easy. And let's work with stakeholders to find out what is some of the common information that they need for things like accreditation, reporting. So we have to give, uh, we have to be licensed in any state we do fundraising. We have to be licensed in any state where we do substantial education. And so we have to bring a lot of data to those places. Our board is data driven. So, you know, in, in order for me to hopefully stay with you guys for a little longer, I've got to show them some metrics and some data that relate to what they have told us they'd like to do. And certainly to measure preeminence and a number of things, we have to have the data. So simple things like tuition. Where are we in tuition? Another one, where are our alumni? So let's say we have an audiology student going to Los Angeles. Well, who's around there from KCOM and ASU and Mosdo? Or if you're planning a trip somewhere and you would like to host an alumni event, this gives you some power to do some of those things. So Brian, I'll let you go. ease of access to data and so this is kind of the foundation for that uh, for that data so um, if you read dr. Phelps perspective you'll know that you can get there by going to the portal so you go to the ATSU portal and you can log in and once you log in here's another little tip you can actually just start typing so if I just start typing institutional research it will automatically search and so institutional research is the title that we're currently working with to get to this area. And what we've built here is a website that is um, the primary home for this kind of data. Okay, so you can see that we've got uh, Dr. Phelps' perspective and his goal, um, create a simplified access point for data, uh, university data distribution. So the navigation is down the left-hand side. So you can see that there are four types of data currently uh, in, in what we're calling the data warehouse. So there's alumni data, there's some donor data, uh, employee profile, and then enrollment data. So let, let's start with some enrollment data. And at the top, you can see there's a description of what type of data we're going to see. So if I scroll down, we're actually going to see the data. But the information at the top is actually fairly important because it tells you what the definition of the data is. There's a section about navigation. And for me, the most important part is the data source. Where is this data coming from? So we can see that this enrollment data is a nightly extract coming from our campus, campus nexus student system, so our student information system. So if I just scroll down here, you can see this is one type of data visualization. And we can see here all of our enrollment data. Uh, if I wanted to go in and look a little bit more detail, just say KCOM, I can click on KCOM and it will bring up just the data for KCOM. If I wanted to look and rather than having it defined by age group, I can click down and I can say, let's say race, race or ethnicity. If I wanted to then look into a little bit more detail, maybe say across the years, I can go in and you can see biomedical science versus DO. I click on that plus and it kind of rolls down into more data. So it's actually drilled down that you can go into a, a fair amount of data and get uh, ask questions and do some analysis. This is not the only type of uh, data visualization. If I go to the home state, you can see that it will bring up a map. And it shows a map. This is of all of our students, where all of our students are from. And if I scroll down here just a little bit, there you go. If I wanted to just see KCOM, for example, I can click over here on the right. 
and then we see just the KCUM students. I can go into an individual state and it will give me more information there as well. Okay. So that's enrollment data. If we wanted to look at uh, enrollment versus our peers, so this data, as you can see, the data source is historical data from iPads. So this is publicly available data, which brings up a good point. This website is only available to us internally within ATSU at this point. But this is public data from iPads. And you can see that we compare AT still. In this case, it's for our osteopathic programs. And because we report to iPad, iPads, both KCUM and SOMA together, that's why the, the numbers here are a little bit um, uh, 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 bigger than we might see. But these are other peer comparisons for other institutions that we feel are our peers. If I wanted to see dentistry, I would click into dentistry, and then you can see that the peers change a little bit. So this data is, again, available. I can cho choose different years if I wanted to. Off to the right, this is kind of an interesting uh, visualization as well. So this shows tuition and fees comparison against our peers. So again, ATSU is in blue. You can see us pretty much in the middle of the pack, um, a little bit below the, the mean. And you can see this is a whisker diagram. So the high is at Loma Linda, looks like 83,000. If we go all the way down to University of Texas uh, Science Center at Houston, 36. So we're, we're in the middle. So again, some really good data. Yep. So let's go to our alumni. So we can keep clicking in here. See 69 alumni in this area, and there it goes. It's starting to populate more. away the lottery numbers uh, for tonight and so I, those who missed it I'm really sorry um, but basically this helps us understand where our alumni are practicing where they're grouped opportunities to interact with them when people travel and Dr. Givitz will talk a little bit more about some of the robust data that we're going to be getting on our alumni uh, and where they practice and etc. Brian did you want to this is a little I need my virtual reality glasses for these but uh, once again, a lot of data. So you can go on, you can kind of play around with it. The donor data is locked, so that's very, it's secure. Once again, this data can only be reached internally. And then we hope to grow it as we learn more of what folks need for their work uh, and, and grow this site. Right, so this is kind of the, the base foundation for what will continue to grow. And uh, the, the next projects are uh, iPads data for financials. So we'll see comparisons against our peers from a financial perspective, uh, some employment data, and then admissions data is also in the queue. So we'll continue to add additional data sources to the data warehouse. So I want to thank John, Brian, and, and the group, and Dr. Gibbets. <laughs> so if we had gone to an outside entity, or if you're the University of Arizona or somebody, it would take you probably years to build the software and get the hardware for this type of system. But they really accomplished this in less than 12 months, which, which is pretty, pretty amazing. So some very good stuff. We're going to, yep, Dr. Gevis is going to talk about that. But yeah, so some of that's on, on that. Those are all alumni. Uh, but Dr. Gevis is going to talk about some more robust data that we're chasing. Dr. Gevis, yeah. No, no, you do whatever you want to talk about. Uh, so let me start with the data. Um, we've contracted 
with um, a unit within the Virginia College of Osteopathic Medicine to track all our alumni data. Um, although what you've seen here is very nice, we have a lot of holes in the alumni data. And we want to make sure that everybody is covered. The alumni data is important for the purposes of advancement. It's for the purposes of our grant getting. So in all of the HRSA grants that we apply for, it's important to identify what percentage and the number of our graduates that serve in underserved areas. That's another aspect of it. Also, with respect to programmatic and also HLC accreditation, it is now essential for us to be able to track all of our alumni. Because in our mission, it says specifically that one of our goals is to serve the underserved. And increasingly, both programmatic and regional accrediting agencies are asking, well, are you fulfilling your mission? And if we only have 10 to 20% of the data in some cases for our programs when they survey their alumni, that is no longer sufficient. So we have to make sure that we have an accurate count, both of the number and percentage of our alumni who do, in fact, serve in underserved areas. And certainly in terms of advancement, that advancement cannot operate as efficiently as it can if it does not know the address or contact information for all of our alumni. Plus, in terms of institutional research, what you've seen is the data. What is important for purposes of accreditation and institutional self-study is what we do with that data. That we have to do analyses in terms of where our graduates practice or whether we're fulfilling our mission. So in, in, in essence, um, what we're contracting for is not only the accurate depiction of data, but for also the analysis of data as well. That's important to our mission. So just wanted to start off with that. Um, what I wanted to do in, in the time that I have is to do a thank you tour of everybody. Um, first, I want to start on the last few days um, some of you have been involved in HLC writing workshops. We had uh, Dr. Larry uh, Griesheber here uh, because it is important for HLC accreditation that we speak with one voice and we know how to answer the questions. We have five standards for the Higher Learning Commission uh, that we have to complete in our self-study. And I want to thank the numerous people both on this campus, on the Arizona campus, and our virtual campus for participating in these standards committees. It is essential. It is important. Right now, we're ahead of the game. We're doing very well uh, in terms of gearing up for the Higher Learning Commission. So I want to thank all of you that are participating um, in that effort. Um, I also um, want to um, deal um, with um, a number of other issues. Uh, second is that um, three-year contracts for faculty. Beginning um, in July 1st, 2017, by working with the University Faculty Senate, who I really applaud for their efforts and their endeavors in this, because this follows a successful adoption of a uh, promotions document, that beginning um, July 1st, 2017, instead of a two-year rolling contract for faculty, we will have a three-year rolling contract for faculty. And that will be, in terms of the contract itself, in terms of the policy itself, I hope in the um, next month that we'll be able to distribute uh, the final policy to all faculty members. I think this is a great advancement, uh, step forward, um, I want to thank the president for approving this. I think it rewards faculty. It provides security for faculty. Um, and um, I, I, I am, just can't say enough about the University Faculty Senate in working to complete uh, this document. Uh, the third um, item uh, on my thank you tour is preeminence. The president said he didn't want to steal my thunder. He largely did. You saw all those <laughs> items. Thank you, thank you very much. Um, I would add to that, it's not only individual achievement, but we have others too. Um, not this past year, but the year before, Dr. Randy Danielson, who is our dean at our Ashes School, 
received the prestigious Stead Award by the um, PA community. It is only the sixth time that that award has been given over a period of about 15 years and just shows, if you will, uh, preeminence as well as the other people that are on that list. I want to thank the Kirksville faculty because one of the areas, uh, and KCOM faculty, because one of the areas of preeminence that I'm looking on is publications. And if one looks, as I have in the last three years of the Journal of the American Osteopathic Association, no school has produced more articles than KCOM. That's really great. There are 31 schools of osteopathic medicine this fall, there are 33. And the fact that no other school really comes close to KCOM in producing articles in the flagship journal of the osteopathic profession. That also adds to preeminence. So again, thank you. I want to thank the Mosdo faculty and staff. It's amazing that, that the amount of effort that you're giving, doing a startup, you know, startup, it sounds nice. The work involved in doing a startup is absolutely tremendous. And I know that particularly the staff at Mosdo has worked really hard in order to get this school going. With a startup, you always have startup issues, startup problems. You have more work than expected. And, and I, I just think the amount of effort that the Mosdo staff has put in has just been absolutely remarkable. So thank you. I want to make mention of the KCOM basic science faculty who have striven to add to the um, curricula excellence of MOSDO, um, that their curriculum is different. It's, it's organized in a different way. It's not the set pattern that, that KCUM does. And for you to participate in this process um, is just absolutely tremendous. So I thank you very much for doing so. I, <laughs> speaking of basic scientists, I want to thank Bill Sexton. I want to thank him for his good humor, his good sportsmanship, for coming in second in the Max Goodenson Golf Championship Monday. I won't say what team came in first, but Dr. Wilson has a big smile on her face for the last 48 hours. Um, I see a number of people here that I want to thank. I want to thank the library staff. I want to thank the museum staff. I use both personally. All of you use um, the library, and, and some of you, or most of you have been, or all of you have been through the museum. And, and it's just two wonderful places. And I want to thank you for your contribution. I want to thank Advancement. Um, I, I have many meetings with Sean Summer um, on the uh, Arizona campus, uh, Bob and others that I've interacted, Randy and others that I've interacted here. On this campus, I want to thank you for your efforts. Um, they, they are so important in terms of moving our school forward. We just cannot um, be dependent upon tuition for revenue. We need external sources of funding, and the effort that you put into it is gratefully appreciated. So thank you. I want to thank finance, the numbers people. Um, I was in meeting with them for an hour and a half today. Um, it is exciting. Maybe I'm a geek, but I like numbers. And, 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 and what they do in terms of making the university run is so important. So true is student services. Um, student services, um, I think when I gave my um, presentation, when I, when I um, was um, running for this job, if you will, and I said about student services that they are the force that makes things work. Um, that they are behind the scenes but omnipresent in terms of what they do for our students to make sure that the university operates. So thank you. And um, I see three IT people here. When was the last time you saw three IT people in the same room? Tell me. I mean, so um, IT is important for making things work, particularly when they don't work, for coming up and fixing it. 
So I just want to thank you as well. Um, let's see, who else? Who have I not acknowledged? Huh? Grants. Grants, sponsored programs. Um, I've said this. Is, Gayla isn't here, is she? No, I didn't see her face. But, but sponsored programs, I think, honestly, I've been at five different universities. I have never seen a better unit in terms of sponsored programs anywhere. In terms of the job they do of analyzing grants, most importantly, for saving us time when we're not competitive and telling us so. They said, don't apply for this because you can't be competitive in this. And, and I trust them in terms of their opinion, but they have been so successful in helping to rank grants that we are capable of getting. And I would say this, that sponsored programs, that the unit that we have could find itself in any top 10 university in this country. So again, for sponsored programs, thank you. Um, the president's administrative staff is here. Um, you, I just enjoy all of you working with all of you. Um, however much that um, you know, I put you through, I just want to thank you. Um, for all the efforts that you do. Thompson Center is represented here. How come you're not running? <laughs> Probably will be. Um, I don't know if I've left anybody out. Oh, yes, I have. Our Opti, which is so important in terms of, of making things run, particularly postgraduate programs. Um, and as some of you know, I'm, I'm very concerned about graduate medical education. Uh, and that's something that's on my front burner in terms of making sure that our graduates have GME PGY1 positions to go into when they graduate. Um, so basically that's what I wanted to say is thank you very much for all you do for AT Still University for helping me do my job. I'm very grateful to you. So yeah, thank you. Yeah. And facilities. Oh, and facilities, facilities. of course. Uh, you know, I knew I, would leave, I knew I would leave somebody out. And who else? Don't forget to vote for Dr. Givitz for mayor uh, in November. No, I'm not uh, running. I will not serve. Will not serve. Okay. 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 All right. We have time, I think, for some questions. Uh, and so, once again, it is you do tremendous work. This is difficult work. It's important work. Um, it is meaningful work. And you get an idea just by thinking of the uh, just for the community health centers. Our graduates, longstanding with KCUM. Remember, we've got a community health center right on campus here, right next door. That Dr. Wilson has been most important in, in keeping it uh, keeping it up and running and keeping the relationship going. So uh, over 490 million visits to community health centers our graduates will be responsible for. If you calculate the number that are currently practicing in community health centers times their 30 years on average, it's over 400 million visits, patient visits that they will take care of and well over 4 million patients that they'll be taking care of. So tremendous work that you do. And that's just in the physician side and the dental side of things. So thank you, thank you. Questions? There is more pizza, I think. But seriously, you know, if there's something that's been on your mind, you're wondering, you know, why this happened or that happened or why this isn't happening, and of course, would you like the microphone? No. Are you sure? No. Let's do it. Just because some people may have a hard time drinking. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> One, do you have uh, consideration in your forward planning for uh, green energy here at the school? So with, I'll do both if you want. I'll repeat them and then if you want to do both. And the other is with your data for alumni, since I'm approaching my 50th year, is that can, are they classified in years, the ones that graduated, so they would be easy to contact? So two questions. First, the answer about, you know, the plan for sustainable energy on campuses? And the answer is yes. I think part of that audit was looking at, I believe so, and I'm, Rick, I'll defer to you, but looked at all the systems, what needs to be upgraded, of course, the boiler plant, partnering with Emron to get their blessing on the boiler plant and perhaps some funding for that. Uh, in Arizona and even now in Missouri, I think some of the ability to go back and look at solar energy uh, for the campuses will become, I think, relevant again. The cost per kilowatt hour was so low in Kirksville and so low in Arizona that you know we would be actually paying money to try to to try to do that. That not that it's not the right thing to do, but tuition dollars um, are the right way. Our building in Arizona, we just have the one building in it, basically is LEED certified. We didn't go for the LEED certification because of the cost. 
this building is LEED certified. So absolutely, we're, we, we are constantly looking at those numbers. Our energy costs are in the hundreds of thousands of dollars. So anything that we can do to prevent that. But sometimes it's really simple, like when you leave the room, turn the light off. I can't tell you how many times I walk by different rooms on the campuses and just poke my head in there, make sure nobody's there, and turn the lights off. In a lot of rooms, we have the automatics, but I, but I do this constantly. People think I'm like a paranoid or something by doing that. But, but we do that, and we try to make sure that any new things that we add are all retrofitted on the Arizona campus. We've retrofitted things with LED lights and moving that forward. So it's, a, it's always at our forefront and, and something that we think about at the facilities level. The second question is how far can we drill that data down? And I think once we get the data from West, from Virginia, from Virginia. Uh, this, yeah. this college, you can actually really just click on and, and find out. Now, the question will be is how we get that information out there in a secure standpoint because there may be some people that you know, may or may not want to be contacted, even though the information could be relative, they could have passed away or had somebody pass away the week before. So there'll probably be some delicacy on how we give the actual addresses and phone numbers and things, but I think that's a, eventually we'll want to look at that. But my guess would be if I wanted to contact my class, I would go to our alumni folks and ask them, you know, the appropriateness and can I do this and how to go about that, and they would assist me in doing that, but, but we want that. The other day is they make sure you have Founders Day too. Yeah. And we might even categorize like when you graduated in terms of diploma, parchment, or tablet. You know, so. Oh, good one. I'm tablet. <laughs> Dr. Gibbs will be at the Duke come in about 8 o'clock for the first show <laughs> and 10 o'clock for the second show. Love it. Very good. Other questions? So I did hear the golf score that uh, Dr. Wilson's I had some, uh, some, you know, ringers on the team. So 61. That's what you always want, 61. 10 under, 10 under, very good, very good. Oh, you're also 10 under. Oh, okay. <laughs> so much for his good sportsmanship. <laughs> good. All right, well, we, we'll be around, so, you know, please come up and ask questions that you have. There's always the idea box you can send things to. We also have, if there's any question of things, and, and, and we don't get them very often, but we have a kind of a 1-800 anonymous hotline. It's mainly for fraud if you see that things are going and, and being done inappropriately. But occasionally we'll get something in there like, you know, why did you paint the bathrooms green? Um, and that's okay too, So, so the, and, and the reason why it was on sale. Um, but, uh, but there's a lot of questions that you, you may have that at any time feel free to, to email us or contact Dr. Gevitz or myself about really about anything, and, and we're usually pretty good at getting back pretty quickly unless we're traveling, uh, but we welcome that. That's why we're here, to serve you, and, and we really enjoy it, and uh, we believe that's an important part of what we do. So, so thank you. We've got uh, Founders Day coming up. We'll have the Board of Trustees on campus, so we'd love to have you come by during the uh, dinner celebration on Friday night and interact with the board. Um, they love it when they get to talk to staff and faculty and students. It kind of makes it very meaningful to them. And that's on this campus how we do our interactions with our board members. Uh, we do have a, a couple big accrediting visits coming up. We have um, the CODA dental accreditation visit coming up in April. Uh -huh. And we have the uh, MOSDO first graduation in June. Uh -huh. So some exciting things that are moving forward that you should once again be proud of and, and be thankful that, uh, that once again we have great teams that, are, that accomplish these types of things. So we're kind of in full mode now, HLC coming up. Uh, HLC, for those of you that aren't really familiar, is kind of like our, think of it, the, the certifying licensing board for institutions in this part of the country. It used to be based on geography, how far the horses and cars could go and, and still make it back. So we are under the HLC in Chicago, and then there's West Coast, Southeast, Northeast, et cetera. So the uh, crediting, uh, thank you for being way out ahead in that. But they're the ones that come in and they check everything. They literally do the full tune-up inspection and then they let us know if we're doing well, and then that seal of approval allows us then to go out and make sure that our students can get the Title IV funds that they need to go to ATSU uh, and go out and do the work that they do. So thank you for those serving on all these accrediting teams. <laughs>